Today on Detroit Muscle, we're gonna class it up with a new project car that's all about the size. Plus, take a gander at the 1,100 horses that we're plugging into it. If you've been watching the show, which you should be, you know that the last few cars we've built have been pony car projects from each of the big three. These cars are small and nimble, and they present an opportunity to throw a good amount of power into a light package. But we feel like it's time to change things up a bit. After all, the original early 60s muscle cars were all much larger than any pony platforms that came later on. And that tradition continued well into the 70s with huge displacement power plants, which were married to class and luxury. Yes, sir. Oh, yeah, girl. You don't know about our 1972 Mercury Marquis Broham. Mm-mm. The inside of this baby is big enough for all your friends. And you ain't gonna want us to go. Because when we do, so does the party, baby. But that's not all she's got going on. That's 19 feet of pure fever. Bigger than any car we've ever worked on. This ride floats down the road like an angel on a cloud, and that illustrious 429 sings like one, too. Mm -hmm. Well, we got our big old Mercury in the shop, and we're ready to get started on it. Now, I know that this platform isn't what we normally kick on here in the shop, but we've got some pretty big plans for it, and we're gonna call it the Highwayman. The reason for that, in the 1960s and ending in 70, Mercury produced the Marauder. Now in 69 and 70, they share the same platform as this car. And they made about 20,000 of those, and they were powered by either the 390 or that big old 429. And another word for Marauder is Highwayman. Now in order for our Merc to live up to that outlaw name we've given it, it really needs to bring the thunder when it comes to power output. And all of that revolves around this baby right here. This is a 557 cubic inch big block that the guys down in engine power built a while back. With this, we're skipping all of the conventional power plant possibilities and going straight to the nuclear option. Just how nuclear are we talking? How about almost 1100 horsepower? They started out with a 460 block, an Eagle rotating assembly, some TrickFlow 325 power port heads along with their R-Series manifold, topped off with a Holley 1150 Dominator. Oh, and they flung a big old shot of nitrous at it too. The block is bored 80 over, and a set of forged rods along with forged pistons rounded out the bottom end. A solid roller cam, double roller timing set, and TrickFlow 1.73 ratio rockers brought it all together. But once it was in the dyno room, that's when things got really impressive. They made all of their pulls on 93 octane pump gas, and starting with 30 degrees of total timing, they made some naturally aspirated runs. Yes, sir! 754. 664 for torque. That is awesome, what? awesome, awesome. Then they plugged in an NOS Big Shot kit and jetted it for 225 horsepower. The timing was dropped to 22 degrees to accommodate the nitrous. That was big. That was big for torque. I saw big torque numbers. Woo! So big, it's off the graph. It's Let's off the, rescale it. It's off the graph. <laughs> oh, 1,031 on power, 996 pound-feet of torque. Once they checked the plugs and bumped the nitrous shot up to 300, along with pulling timing to 19 degrees, what did that make? A thousand and eighty on power, eleven hundred and nineteen pound feet. And all that was done on pump gas. 
So needless to say, even with a car this size and that much power, well, this dude is going to boogie. But you got to make sure that the rest of the car can handle all that power. That's right, because the 429 that came from the factory, it's only making around 200 horsepower. And because we're going to be throwing over five times that much power at it, we got some work to do. The next thing that we got to do is get all that old junk out of the way. Now, I know this pan may look like it's on backwards, but I promise you that it's not. Our car requires a front sump pan because of the location of the cross member. The pan that was on this engine was a rear sump, so we got a new pickup, new pan from Summit Racing, and we went ahead and got those installed. Now, whenever you're making the power level that we are, you've got to think downstream just a bit, kind of like the transmission, because if it won't hold it, well, that's a whole lot of work for nothing. So we went with a Mega Monster from Monster Transmission. This thing's had a boatload of internal work done to it to accept that big power number. Kind of like a recalibrated valve body, custom machine parts to accept more clutches, and a custom accumulator. And this piece is going to do more than just get the job done for us. Another important piece to the puzzle is the torque converter. So we went with the 19 to 2300 stall HD 10 inch converter. Now this thing's tailored fit to meet our specifications. It comes with everything you need to do the install, including the fluid and the dipstick. And it's just about time for us to bolt this transmission and engine together. Coming up, we'll plug in that nasty big block and show you how headers are able to free up power. I want to know why they call these things flex plates. Anyway, we got our block plate reinstalled and we got this new flex plate from Mazir. It's billet steel and it's zero balance, which is perfect because our engine is internally balanced. We found some ARP bolts, got those things torqued to specs. Now we're ready to tie these two together. All right, a little bit. All right, we're gonna need to go up some. Come on, come on. We needed new motor mounts and a starter, so we went to rockauto.com to get those. Alright guys, you might notice that the inside of the engine bay here looks a little bit different than it did before. We went ahead and did quite a bit of cleaning and sprayed on some flat black. That way when we drop that big piece of jewelry off into that hole, it's going to look really nice in there. Looks good. We've said it before and we'll say it again. These engine tilters are a lifesaver when it comes to swapping engines and transmissions. They let you angle the tail of that trans down to get into the tunnel and make it easier to keep the oil pan off your sheet metal. It's not every day that you get to see what a gussied up motor like this looks like sitting in a big old land yacht, but today is the day. May have to massage it. Now with that big stroker motor sitting at home looking all nice and pretty, it's time to move on toward the exhaust. Now originally our car came with exhaust manifolds, but with that highly modified engine, if we were to use them, they wouldn't be doing us any favors. So we opted for a set of these long tube headers from Hooker. And these are originally designed to fit an early 70s Torino, but we went ahead and trial fit them and they're gonna work for us just fine. Now most of you have probably always heard that headers will help you make more power, but you're not sure why or how that works. Well, one part of it is freeing up airflow, but there's more to it than that. 
On a factory style exhaust manifold, the passageways are typically a rudimentary design and are simply there to provide a route for the exhaust gases to exit toward the tailpipe. The problem with this is that due to the timing of the exhaust pulses, the collector on the manifold can form a bottleneck and make it more difficult for your engine to push exhaust gases through the system, especially when you've made modifications to the engine. A good set of headers are designed around the timing of the pulses. Not only are the primary tubes much larger, but each tube is calibrated with the firing order of the engine accounted for. They allow the pulses to pass through the collector without creating a bottleneck and can even provide the added benefit of a small scavenging effect which pulls the succeeding pulse through the system after it. Together, these differences free up the exhaust flow, which frees up more power. Now that's the short but sweet version because there's a lot of science behind making a good set of headers. It's kind of like, typically you're gonna make more power with a long set of tubes as opposed to a set of shorties. And it's an almost guarantee that you're gonna make more power with a set of headers than a set of those exhaust manifolds. Still ahead, check out the eye candy we've got to go under the hood of that big Mercury. Hey guys, while you were gone, we decided to go ahead and switch out our valve covers. Now the reason we did that is because these sheet metal valve covers are really bulky and they were really close to the AC box there in the back. So we went ahead and got some tapered ones from TrickFlow. They're cast and they can leave a little bit more room in the back there. So when the engine moves, it's not gonna get into that case. Now, the next thing we're gonna do is get some accessories bolted on here. To get all that done, we went to Summit Racing and got us a full serpentine setup from March Performance. And this kit comes with everything you're going to need to get the job done. And this is almost a must since we're plus a thousand horsepower. Otherwise, with those V-Groove belts, well, we'd be fighting putting them things on all the time. But the first piece to this puzzle is installing this crank pulley. This is a pretty simple deal. It's just three bolts that hold it onto the front of the balancer. Now, in the case of our alternator, we're going to reuse the stock one. Some WD-40 will make the old pulley easy to get off. With that out of the way, we'll hit it with some brake cleaner to get any of the nasty stuff off of there. This thing would look pretty goofy as it is with all those shiny pieces, so we need to get it masked up for paint. With the terminals good and protected, we'll bust out a can of Duplicolor engine enamel in the trusty old black variety. Once that's dried for a little bit, we can flip the alternator over and finish spraying it. After a few minutes, we can unmask it and start installing those shiny bits. With the water pump ready to go on, we'll lay down a bead of sealer on the mating surface, being sure to account for the water passages while we're at it. With the gasket in place, we'll toss another bead down for good measure, then plug in our pump. Now we can install that prettied up alternator using the brackets provided in the kit. Then the water pump pulley can go on to its new home. Of course, we need to toss in the idlers, tensioners, all that good stuff. All right, guys, ready to move on to the next step of the process, which would be installing the power steering pump and our AC compressor. But we run into a small snag, if you will. And no big surprise, we're crossbreeding a GM pump to this Ford hose. But we've got an order and adapter. That's no real big deal, but it's gonna take a little bit of digging to find out which one we're gonna need exactly. So we'll catch you guys after the break. 
Stick around and we'll show you how to modify a cross member to work with big exhaust. Hey guys, while you were gone, we went ahead and buttoned up the rest of our belt drive and we went on to the cooling system. Now we installed a radiator fan combo from Summit Racing and what you get is a two row aluminum radiator, the shroud, the fans, you even get a controller with all the wiring and it only runs about 400 bucks, which is pretty good. The headers we chose were for a Torino and our car, well, it's a full size. They fit, but kind of didn't. Where they didn't is right here where the collector comes out. It's kind of running into or interfering with our cross member. Now, we didn't show you the installation of the cross member, but while we had it out, we went ahead and cleaned it up and sandblasted it because we knew we were going to do some welding on it. And here's our plan of attack. So what we're going to do is cut it across here and across here, remove that piece, and then weld in a big heavy U and move the U up toward the bottom of the floor. Now, you don't have to worry about the cross member itself bouncing against the floor pan because it's stationary but you do want to move it up so you can have plenty of room for your exhaust pipe to move around. We'll bust out a screw jack to keep the transmission in place once the cross member has been cut. Then a straight edge helps to mark the cutting points. Some masking tape on the end of the headers will keep us from slinging any sparks into them or the engine. Then we're ready to cut. The bulk of the chopping can be done with a cutoff wheel, then we'll bust out the body saw to finish it, since it's easier to get to the top layer of metal with that. Measure across there, or six and a quarter. Now this is that serious piece of metal that I was talking about. It's a piece of five inch, half inch thick angle iron. Now what we're going to use is a couple of pieces of this and weld it together to make our U-shaped piece. You could use a piece of flat bar, but then you've got to bend it. Not everybody has a way of bending a piece of metal that large. The cross member itself is four and a half inches wide, so we'll duplicate that here. Obviously this is too wide, so we're going to have to do a little bit of trimming to get it down to that six and a quarter that we're looking for. Now you could cut it just once and then try to weld it up. The problem with that, you don't have any good way to kind of clamp it in place and it's going to pull on you. So we're actually going to have to cut both of them to get our six and a quarter. I'm going to put a double bevel on here. With the metal being as thick as it is, it will help to ensure that we have a nice, strong joint. Now we're ready to weld this giant piece of metal up. Now if you were at home and you had a smaller welder, you could take a torch and preheat this thing and get it good and hot and that helped the penetration. But we've got those ESOB welders and they'll practically weld anything that'll hold still long enough. Also, with this being a piece of hot roll, it's always a good idea to grind it back to that shiny side. A couple of clamps are a good idea to keep your pieces held flat. With the amount of heat that's being put into them, there's a good chance that they'll try to pull on you. The welder is turned up pretty high, and one nice thing about welding thick metal like this is that you don't have to baby it near as much as that thinner stuff. A piece of cardboard will make a good shim to keep our new section off of the floor when we mark our cutoff points. Well, we trimmed that thing off to cut off all that excess that was hanging down. Now we just have to set this up here, weld it up, and it'd be that easy. Now that gives us plenty of room for our exhaust, but that'll have to wait till next time. So you guys come back and see us. Today on Detroit Muscle, give me fuel, give me fire. Give me a way to run that 1100 horsepower big block in our Monster Mercury project. Today, we'll show you how to plumb a fuel system for a big power application, as well as building custom exhaust that'll let this mean mother blow your house down.
Hey guys, thanks for joining us. Now we've got our 72 Mercury Marquee back here in the shop and we just finished putting an almost 1100 horsepower big block under the hood. Now we're getting ready to turn this thing into 19 feet and two tons of fun. But first, this thing's gonna drink a lot of fuel. So we need to figure out how to get a fuel system installed. Now, oftentimes, whenever you think about the term fuel system, carburetor comes to mind. Now this is the one that came off of our 429 originally. Well, somebody had done an upgrade. It's a 600 manual choke vacuum secondary, and it ran really well on it, but since we're making that big old power number, we're gonna need a big old carburetor. This is Holley's 1150 Ultra Dominator carburetor, and has several features to it. A few of them, well, it has a TPS mount just in case you're running data acquisition. It also has dual 50 pumps, and with its all aluminum construction, makes it a lot lighter as opposed to the earlier models. Now we're not going to bother you guys with showing you how to bolt on a carburetor because you've done it or seen us do it a whole bunch of times. But there is a lot more to do on our fuel system. Now to feed that big Dominator carb, we need a massive fuel system. So we turn to Holly and Earl's for a bunch of components that are going to feed it. Now we've got everything from the hose to the wiring, hose ends, regulator, gauge, the filters, and of course the pump. Now this pump, it's 160 gallon per hour aluminum Dominator pump and it'll support up to 1800 horsepower, so we don't have to worry about starving that big block. And check this out. This is the latest from Holly. It's called Hydromat. And what it does is it acts as a bladder inside your tank, replaces a traditional pickup tube. It's available in all different types of sizes and shapes, and you can even order custom ones. It works with stock and aftermarket fuel cells. Perfect for drag racers, road racers, drifters, or anytime the fuel's gonna be sloshing around in the tank. Now it has a 15 micron filter built in, so there's no need for a pre-filter. And with its bladder design, basically if it's touching fuel, it's gonna get to your engine. Now, before we can install that into our tank, which we've already removed out of our mercury, we need to do some things to get this tank ready. First thing to do is get this pickup and sending unit pulled out so that we can access the inside. Then we'll grab a jug of gas tank flush and dump it on in. This is basically a cleaner and degreaser that's non-flammable and non-corrosive. Should be good. Now that we got all the cleaner in there, I'm gonna slosh this around a little bit, get all those fumes out. That smells gone. Looks like old Mark has himself a mystery noise inside that tank. Mm. How long that's been in there? All right, so we've got our tank all cleaned out now and dry, so we don't have to worry about any fumes left here when we get ready to drill our holes. The reason we need to drill into our tank is because if you look here at our sending unit, this is the hole that was used for our feed really not big enough, especially when you compare it to the dash 10 that our pump requires. Now this is required for the feed and the return, so we need to drill two holes. We chose the top of the tank here near the vent. We just need to mark the holes and drill them. Now to do that, we've got a couple tips for you to help keep the shavings out of the tank and to keep you safe. Which way you wanna go? This way. One easy way to keep shavings out of the tank is to drill up from the bottom so that gravity helps keep them out. We're also using a pneumatic drill since an electric one can generate sparks. A little grease on a step drill bit will also help keep the shavings under control as well as eliminating sparks. No need for high speed, take it slow and easy. We're gonna jump on in here with a reamer and knock the rough edge down on these holes. Then after that, a magnet is a great way to fish around for any shavings that manage to make it into the tank. Just look at that. A little Earl's assembly lube on the O-ring for our bulkhead fitting will help us tighten the fitting without tearing the seal. We 
use a tape measure to find the length that our pickup hose needs to be. These Earl's Ultra Pro fittings don't just work great and look nice, they're a cinch to put together. Don't forget the lube! As for the hose, it's Earl's Ultra Pro, which is a premium line of plumbing. It's PTFE lined and is extremely flexible. Plus, it's good to use on gas, alcohol, ethanol, and E85. With the hydro mat rolled up nice and tight, we can work on getting it in the tank via the filler neck hole. Once it's in, we can attach our pickup hose. You can see that we have magnets attached to the corners to keep it in place once it's positioned on the bottom of the tank. This part can be a little tricky. We'll fish the pickup line to our bulkhead fitting and then get it threaded on. And in case you're wondering, the braided steel Ultra Pro line can be immersed in gas, no problem. We went ahead and reinstalled our pickup tube and sending unit assembly, but we did modify the tube. We're not going to need that anymore, so we blocked it off, but we are going to reuse the sending unit. We had to reinstall our vent and install new hoses here. These are 20 foot long each. That way we can ride them wherever we need to once we get it in the car. Well, let's go ahead and do that now. What do you say? All right. Still ahead, we gotta find a way to keep our big bad fuel pump off the pavement. Then we'll turn a whole bunch of stainless steel tubes into a gnarly three inch exhaust system to let our mercury exhale nice and easy. Plus a little history lesson about welding. Hey guys, while you were gone, we went ahead and reinstalled that tank and got the straps tight. We ran both of those feed and return lines all the way to the front of the car, but we need to break the feed line to install the pump. Now there's a couple tricks to this. The pump needs to be installed lower than the tank, low as possible, and normally you would mount a pre-filter and a post-filter, but because we're using that hydro mat, we only need the post-filter. We do need to include it here, so we just need to figure out where we're going to mount this thing. Uh, this looks like a pretty good place to mount the pump. There's a pocket here in the floor so we can get it up, get it away from where anything on the road is going to hit it. We could probably mount it this way here. It'll keep it away from where the exhaust is going to be. The muffler's probably going to be right in here. So we'll make a bracket. Okay, we're not going to make this too complicated. We're going to use a piece of eighth inch plate, do a little bit of cutting, a little bit of welding, and it'll be that simple. Alrighty, we went ahead and drilled a couple of holes so that we can mount it to the frame. And then I went ahead and cut a couple gussets. So now we need to weld all these together and we can mount it up under the car. We busted out our ESOB MIG Master 280 Pro to get this bracket burned together. Thanks, looks good. I went ahead and made the ends on the hoses here and we're getting ready to mount the pump. Now, in order for us to do that, we're gonna use this tool right here. Now what this is looks like a rivet gun, but it's threaded nut inserts. What we're gonna do is just screw these on the tool here, slide them in, crimp them down, and we don't have to worry about the threads coming out. Like we said, we're gonna keep this nice and simple. A couple of 90s will get our line to the pump and we'll get it screwed down to our bracket to keep it at home. We need to use this filter in addition to the hydromat. The zip ties are temporary while we work up the fittings for this filter.
Some of these DEI exhaust bands will work like a charm to keep our filter in place once it's plumbed. There you go, we just gotta wire it up with a 40 amp relay and we're good to go. Now to finish up our fuel system, we went ahead and mounted our regulator up top. That way it's easy to keep a check on our fuel pressure and whenever you go to dial it in, you don't have to stand on your head. Oh yeah, another thing, we got our solenoids for the nitrous mounted up as well. Now to light the fire on this big block, we went with an MSD Blaster 2 coil along with one of their ignition boxes. And to send that fire where it needs to be, we got an MSD Pro Billet distributor and a set of their wires. With all that taken care of, the next thing we need to do is make sure this big block can exhale. After the break, we'll show you some new technology in the world of welding that can make your life way easier. And it'll help us get that exhaust welded up real nice. All right, we're getting to the point now where we can start installing our exhaust system on our big Mercury. There's a few things we need to take into consideration. One of those is the drive shaft. Now, we don't have our drive shaft yet. We're actually going to replace it with a larger aftermarket one. So for now, we've just got this piece of tubing in here. We rigged it up, and that'll take the place for it. Also, for the rear end, now the exhaust is going to loop over the rear end, and when the suspension travels up and down, it could interfere. So we remove the springs. That way, we can modulate the rear up and down with these pole jacks during installation. For the exhaust on our Mercury, we decided to go with a 3-inch stainless steel hot rod kit from Borla. We upgraded our kit to these big block Ford crate mufflers. In addition to those, we got a variety of mandrel bins to help us get that exhaust from the front to the back. Of course, it also includes the straight sections. You'll need to get it back there as well. And to top it all off, this stuff is going to look great under that car. We'll start by mounting the flange to the collector on our header. Then we'll grab a 45 degree tube and mark where we want to trim the end down to get it pointed in the right direction. With that done, we'll put it in place and grab our ESOB Rebel Welder. We set this welder up with stainless wire and we're going to put it on the smart MIG mode, which will take any guesswork out of the settings. We're dealing with 16 gauge tube, so we'll roll with that. All right, now we've got this pipe headed straight toward the rear of the car. We're going to kick it in with this 45. We'll cut a section out of here and bring this pipe outward toward the hump here. Then we'll attach a straight pipe to it toward the muffler in the back. These are the goals for the exhaust system. Obviously, we want to make sure that it doesn't get into any moving parts like the drive shaft or get bound up in the suspension. But well, we also need to make sure that it's tucked up as high as possible against the floor so that it doesn't drag. Now we talked a little bit about the pipes we got from Borla, which we're using to build the exhaust system here on our Mercury. Now let's talk about the mufflers. This is a set of Borla's 3-inch crate mufflers, which are specially tuned to optimize the sound and performance of a built big block Ford, which is perfect for us. Now they offer those in three different sound levels, from touring all the way up to the super loud attack series. We chose the S-Type, which is the middle of the road option. Now we have our exhaust routed over the rear end and free and clear of all our rear suspension. We kept it kind of tight here under the frame rail. That way when we put some wider tires on the rear, we don't have to worry about it interfering. Now Borla did send us these really nice shiny tips as well, but really the only way we found we can make them look nice is to dump them all the way out the back like this. Then we have this long tube hanging out underneath the car. So we found a better way. We're gonna take these 45s like this, kick them out the side, 
tilt it down just a little bit, dump it out here, right behind the rear tire. It's pretty good right there. I think that's what we're gonna do. After the break, we'll show you an easy way to get rid of rust, and it's as safe as can be. Hey guys, while you were gone, we went ahead and pulled our exhaust system out from underneath our big Mercury. Now, if you'll remember, we tack welded all this together using that new Rebel that we got from Aesop Welding and Cutting. What's really cool about that machine is not only will it MIG, but it'll also stick and TIG weld. Lucky for us, because we want to make that new exhaust system look really nice. The way to set it up for TIG mode is first to reverse the polarity by switching the ground lead to the positive side. Then we'll grab the TIG torch and plug it into the negative side. We'll unhook the eight pin wire from the MIG lead and plug in the TIG one, which allows the machine to communicate with the torch. Then we can switch it from smart MIG mode over to lift TIG and then dial in our amperage. 40 is a good place to start in this case. Last of all, we'll turn on pure argon. ESAB is the front runner when it comes to welding technology. Its founder, Oscar Kielberg, developed the world's first coated welding electrode in 1904. This revolutionized the worlds of construction and fabrication with the advent of the arc welder, allowing vastly improved strength and speed of welding. So yeah, you could say that they invented welding as we know it. Of course, over the years they've improved the techniques with wire feeding, gas shielding, and TIG machines which continue to improve the quality and capability of welders. Our shop is outfitted 100% with ESOB welding gear, which we use exclusively. This Rebel unit is a great machine. It runs on both 110 or 220 power and works great for both the beginner and a master fabricator. Oh, and one trick that we're using to shield the backside of the tube is to plug another argon bottle into it and let it fill the exhaust with argon. That keeps the inside of the welds as strong and clean as the top side. There you go, we got our exhaust system all welded up. Now all we need to do is put it under the car. Hey guys, one last thing we wanna do is get our bumpers all stripped down so that we can send them off to advanced plating and have them re-chromed. Now the backing on these things are full of rust and oftentimes we'd sandblast them, but for those guys out there that don't have access to a sandblaster, we got something to get that rust off that'll work just as good. What we're gonna use to get this nasty rust off this old bracket is a Vaporust Super Safe Rust Remover. And it's so safe that in most cases, you can pour it down the drain. Now it's water soluble, pH neutral, which means it's non acidic and biodegradable, which means a lot if you got kids or pets running around. Now we've let this bracket sit for a couple hours and where it's been in the solution has turned all black. Now all we have to do is get at it with this rag to see all the good that it's done. Now you can see that it removed all that old nasty rust with practically no effort. Now if you were working with a big piece, you could wrap it with a paper towel, then saturate it with the evaporust and then wrap all that with some plastic wrap and then you'd be good to go. But we're all out of time for now, guys. We'll catch you on the flip side. Today on Detroit Muscle, we continue on our Monster Mercury build, the Highwaymen. We got to make sure that 1,100 horsepower can make it to the ground with a massive suspension overhaul. Hey, guys, thanks for joining us. Now, today we're getting back on our big Mercury project, the Highwaymen. Now, if you'll remember, we stuffed a big block under the hood that makes over a thousand horsepower. And to support it, we got a built transmission, big fuel system, and exhaust. Today, we're moving on to the suspension, brakes, and rear end. Now, our old car came from the factory with a nine inch under it. But whenever you factor in that big power and the weight of that old girl, well, it's just not strong enough. So we have to go with an aftermarket unit. So we gave our friend John Curry with Curry Enterprises a phone call. John, what'd you bring us? Well, we got a complete F9 rear end here, set of 35 spline axles, 
complete nodular iron third member, and a set of 11 inch brakes to put on this thing. The housing itself is our F9 three inch tube setup. It's a fabricated housing with billet large bearing housing ends. It's back braced for maximum strength and a high horsepower application. Whenever we started down the path to find a rear axle for our Mercury, we had a little bit of a concern because it's kind of an odd duck because I'm sure you guys don't get a whole lot of calls for a 72. No, we don't, but Curry Enterprises is known for building customer ends. And for most popular applications, we have all the brackets. On this particular one though, we put some pieces together. We use the Chevelle spring buckets, the Jeep shock mounts, and Toyota control arm brackets. Why don't we talk about the center section? Well, what we got here is our nine plus nodular iron gear case, our nine plus big bearing pinion support, billet yoke, 35 spline true track, and set up with a set of 3.0 gears for that big block motor. Now, normally this kit would come to you fully assembled and ready to go. And they have the option of having the housing powder coated just in case you need it. Well, we shipped it to you in pieces, but now it gives us the opportunity to put it all back together and take a look at what we got going on on the inside. These axle shafts are inch and a half, 35 spline performance axles, set 20, Timken bearing, heavy duty retainer plate, and half 20, three inch long studs. The stock axles are only 28 spline, and these axles are over twice as strong. You wouldn't want to put this much into a rear end and put the wrong oil in it. The 9 plus gear oil, 85140, is specifically formulated for the 9 inch Ford. One last thing is our 11 inch disc brake kit. This is not only our most popular disc brake kit, it's also our most economical disc brake kit. Like we said a minute ago, normally these rear ends would come assembled from Curry. And now that we've taken a look at what makes this thing work, we can get ours together as well. John, I want to say thanks for this trick piece. Now it's time for us to get a little bit busy and put this old car on some air. You're welcome to stick around and get your hands dirty if you'd like. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. I've enjoyed myself out here, but I got an invitation to go to Moab, Utah and do some off-roading, so we're off. Well, let's get you on a plane, man. All right. We're really trying to cover all the bases whenever it comes to putting that big power to the ground. We've got our old rear out and the next step to do is going to be beefing up those trailing arms and that's not going to be as bad as it sounds. Now the way we're going to do that is we're going to make our own control arms. Like we said earlier, we sent Curry all of our stock dimensions on our Mercury. The advantage to that is uh, this setup's already a three link with a pan hard rod, which means it's going to handle really well on the street and on the track, but we do need to get rid of these soft stock bushings. We're going to do that with these solid rod ends. We just got all this stuff from QA1. We got some left-handed and right-handed thread ends, lock nuts, and some inserts that'll weld into the tubing. Uh, we just take these ends and we'll mock up our stock control arms and weld a piece of tubing in between. Simple as that. First, I'll head on over to borrow some tube from Ian in Extreme Off-Road. He won't mind. Now before we measure, we're going to go ahead and run the tubing adapter out about halfway down the rod. That way we can adjust both in and out. We're going to make our tubes just a shade shorter than our flange to flange measurement because we want to leave a bit of a groove to act as a natural bevel for our weld to penetrate the rod ends. We'll use our ESOB Rebel MIG welder to tack them, then jump to its TIG welder to burn them solid. Right now that we've got our control arms built, it's time to get the rear end mounted underneath the car. But there's one problem. The original suspension bolts were 9 16 thick we're upgrading to 5.8, so we need to drill these holes out some more. 
Another thing you may notice is the mufflers and tailpipes aren't here. That's because when we build our exhaust system, we left the welds at the front of the mufflers just tacked. That way we could remove all that for this very reason. We'll get those back in before we get our rear end buttoned up. It's important to use spacers like these that we also got from QA1 because they prevent binding during suspension movement or travel. For the lower arms, we'll mount them to the car first, then bring it down so that we can hook everything up. Then we can bring it down and get the upper arm fastened as well. The last thing we'll do is articulate it to check for any problem. Coming up, learn how to adapt your suspension system to work with airbags. Hey guys, welcome back. From the get-go, we weren't real sure what exactly we were gonna do on our old Mercury regarding the suspension. Well, we finally pulled the trigger and we decided to put this old girl on air. So we went to Summit Racing and got us a full kit. Now it comes with a five gallon, eight port steel tank and four bags that are gonna replace our coil springs. Now you gotta have valves to control the air. So we went with the Chrome 3 8 in size and it may look like a bunch of them here, but we'll talk a little more about that later. It also comes with a boatload of fittings. Now you won't use each and every one of these, but it's handy to have them on hand. The kit also includes two of these dual needle 200 PSI gauges and all the line it's gonna take to get you plumbed up. Now don't forget, you're gonna need some of this electricity strain to wire up that shiny compressor. There are quite a few things you need to take into consideration when installing an adjustable air suspension like we're gonna be running. One of those is wheel and tire clearance. Now we went ahead and installed the wheels and tires that we're gonna be running on the rear of our big old Mercury. These American racing wheels were dreamed up by famous automotive artist Max Grundy, and they're named the Stella. They're a modern interpretation of classic wheel styles from the 50s, with all the advantages of modern two-piece construction and forging processes. We wrapped them with some Mickey Thompson ET Street SS's. These sticky Mickeys are a high performance street to strip radial and they're DOT approved. We've got our rear end at full compression, which means the car is as low as it's gonna be on our axle. There's plenty of clearance in the front, the rear, and even up top, but we need to operate this thing through its full range of motion to make sure there's clearance everywhere because of the design of this suspension. As the axle moves up and down, it's gonna move forward and rear of the vehicle. All right, guys, we got the rear mocked up as aired all the way up and then some. And we've got enough clearance except for it right here up front and it's a little bit tight but that won't ever be a problem because the car won't ever be aired up this high just like we were talking about the link bars causing the rear to move we've got a panhard bar on this thing too and it causes the rear to move left to right look what it does whenever we put this thing at ride height what that did give us a little bit more room like what we were needing now, another common area that you run into clearance issues is here at the dry shaft and the tunnel, because whenever that rear starts to go up, so does the dry shaft. So make sure to check it out. We're in pretty good shape, so we can move on. These air springs, or air bags as they're commonly known, are not a direct replacement. They're actually universal and most of the time need to be adapted to fit in your application. As you can see here, this is a spring out of the rear of our Mercury and it's quite a bit taller than this air spring. But we can't just take the measurement here on the table and use that to make our adapters. It's actually a bit more complicated than that and it has to do with the specs of the spring. Ours have a maximum height of 12 and a half inches, which is full inflation. When you deflate it, it can be compressed down to 2.8 inches. Clearly, ride quality will be diminished drastically at both minimum and maximum height, but there is a sweet spot which is between six and nine inches in overall height. So to optimize ride quality, we're shooting for right down the middle at seven and a half inches. We've got our rear end set at ride height, and now it's time to do some math. We know our bag will be seven and a half inches tall, and here we have nine and three quarter inches between the frame rail and this perch. So that means we've got two and a quarter inches to fill. 
Hey, welcome back. Now, Tommy just finished measuring on the rear of our Mercury to determine how much of a spacer we need between our air spring and spring perch. He figured out we needed two and a quarter inches. Now we could put that all at the top or all at the bottom, or we could put some at the bottom and some at the top, depending on where we want the spring to live. Now for us, we want to put it all at the top, but we are running these quarter inch plates, both at the top and the bottom. So we'll just subtract a half inch from our measurement, leaving us with an inch and three quarter, which we're going to cut out of this piece of pipe that we got from a local steel yard. We'll go ahead and blast our spacer because we're going to be doing some welding on it. Then we'll grab the TIG torch from our ESOB Rebel again and get it tacked to our mounting plate. We'll use a hole saw to make an access hole through the frame and body here. The reason we need to do this is to allow a pathway for the airlines, as well as allowing access to fasten the mounting bolts. Now we're going to set the bag in place for a bit of a test squeeze. So as you can see here at full compression, there's a lot of side load on the bag because of where we have this mounted. To remedy that, we need to move this blower mount back some and try it again. It might take a few attempts to get this lined up the way it needs to be, but it's important because if you do it wrong, you're going to assassinate your bag. Nobody likes that. So after moving our lower spring mount back some, we went ahead and compressed the bag again. As you can see here, it's a lot straighter. Another thing you need to look at is to make sure that the bag doesn't hit anywhere here in the frame because if it's going to do that, it'll damage the bag. So now all we need to do is mark where the upper mount needs to weld to the frame, take it all apart, weld it in. We'll get the area prepped for welding with a small grinder. Then we get our upper mount burned into the car. A little black dupla color will dress it up for us. Then we can reinsert that big old bag. While Mark's in the back finishing up that rear, I've been up here doing a little bit of plumbing. Now this right here may look a little bit intimidating, but really and truthfully, it's just time consuming. Let me explain it to you. We've got eight individual valves, but really and truthfully, you have only four circuits. You've got, let's say, these two for the front and these two for the rear. And how this would work is there's compressed air inside of the tank. You trip this valve, the air flows through there, down up to your front bag. And then let's say you want to let it out. It will back feed whenever you trip this valve and back out, allowing the car to go down. Now to wire them up, it's pretty simple. You've got a ground and then you've got a trigger wire. And this is where your options come in. You can wire them so that you can control them all individually, meaning if you want one corner of the car, or you can, let's say, wire them in pairs so the front comes up, front goes down, same with the rear. Or let's say you can wire all four of them together so the whole car comes up or the whole car goes down. It all depends on what you want. Now here on top of the tank, we installed a Schrader valve, and this will allow us to put air in it just in case we ever run into some kind of issue. Now another thing that you want to make sure to install is a drain, because just like your compressor at the house, this thing will get some moisture in it and you'll need to let it out. Now to operate the compressor, or turn it on and off, we went ahead and installed a pressure switch. What this is going to do is cut it on and off with a maximum pressure of 175. Now, speaking of the compressor, it comes with a hose. You want to make sure to use this one for a couple of reasons. One of them, it's got a check valve. It allows the air to go in, but not have to fight with it pushing up against it. Second of all, you want to make sure to use this one because the air coming out of it is hot. If you use this nylon stuff to feed the tank, it's going to melt and just give you troubles. Now it's time to mount this thing in the back of the car. Let's go. 
After the break, it's time to see what that massive Merc looks like. Hey guys, while you were gone, we got our tank and our pump mounted here in the trunk. Now we're going to jump on toward the front and get on it, and then we can move to getting this thing plumbed up. All right, so we've already done the other side, so we have a pretty good idea of what needs to be done here in the front to get our mercury laid out on the ground. Now we've already removed the spring and shock, as well as the sway bar, the brake caliper, and the tie rod. So now it's time to get dirty. We need to cut out this old spring perch to provide a good spot to attach the bottom air spring mount. Ooh, that's hot. We're also gonna cut into the frame right here to make room for the bag itself. That's hot too. The upper shock mount goes away as well to access the air lines and bolts. Ha! We're gonna get after those cut points with a grinder to make them look nicer. Plus a bunch of jagged edges next to a pressurized airbag might make things a little bit too exciting. This old fuel line ain't doing nothing but sitting in the way. A quick whooping on this seam will close up the hole and add to our clearance. We need to make sure we have enough room for the air spring with at least eight inches either direction. We good. Since we sliced up the frame right here, we're gonna weld it back together to keep things nice and strong. After a little cleanup, we can move on. Time to get that upper mount and spacer welded in. The plate is offset so that we'll have proper clearance when the bag is installed. Everything can go back together now. Looks like we might need to come back later on and replace that ball joint. We'll double check our travel, then tack the bottom mount in. Make sure you pull that thing out before you weld it solid. You don't want to burn your bag, man. All right, guys, we got everything wired up and plumbed up, and it's ready to see what she's going to look like sitting on the ground. Now, one nice thing about that adjustable suspension is you can raise it up, lower it down, depending on your personality of the day. Mr. Marcus, go ahead and let's see what she looks like. Here we go. That's it. Wow. She's low. Today on Detroit Muscle, our monster Mercury, the Highwayman, is getting buttoned up for a shakedown run, but she's not ready just yet. Learn how to measure for shocks on custom suspension, as well as some other details to tidy her up. Also, take a look at a low buck upgrade that opens the door to a whole lot of other mods. Hey guys, welcome to Detroit Muscle. Now you guys know what we do around here. Oftentimes we take an old body car, fix up the exterior, throw a lot of performance at it and have us a really good time. Now we've got some big plans for this 69 Dodge Charger, but it's just gonna have to hang out for a minute because we're gonna be jumping on an old project. That's right, you guys may remember this. It's our 1972 Mercury Marquee Brougham and you could say it's been on the back burner, but in spite of all that neglect, it's come a long way from where it started. You've seen these cars before. Even though they're not as common as they used to be, the Big Three cranked out a ton of these 70s era land yachts back in the day. This 72 Mercury Marquis is all about being classy. Mm -hmm. But we threw classy out the window when we snagged this 557 cubic inch big block from the guys down in engine power. On spray, it managed to twist out <laughs> over a thousand horsepower. Then we tied a monster automatic trans behind it and plugged them into that big old white Merc. We also got busy upgrading the fuel system because she's gonna be real thirsty. Then we let her breathe with a big old set of Borla exhaust. As for the rear end, we talked to Curry and got this beefed up nine inch, then fabricated some custom control arms that are gonna be way stronger than the factory ones. 
We also picked up some 20 inch wheels from American Racing that are gonna help our marquee grab some eyeballs. Then we installed some airbags that we got from Summit Racing along with the tank and lines. That lets us layer out nice and low. That's it. Well, we're not too far off on this thing. We do need to get some bumpers on here and it doesn't have any shocks or a drive shaft yet. And we really need to figure out how we're gonna get the hood to clear that big old carburetor. We have some other loose ends, but other than that, we're really close. And hopefully by the end of the day today, we're gonna be behind the wheel of this old girl. The first order of business for today is mounting a set of shocks here on the back side of our Mercury. Now this can be kind of complicated, but not nearly as bad as on the front. Now you don't really have to have them up there because this thing's got airbags on it and you don't have the recoil of a conventional spring. But back here on the back, we're gonna have some weight transfer and we wanna make sure that we can dampen that as much as possible. We need to measure the maximum length of our shock at this point. Now the rear axle's at full droop or let's say aired all the way up. Now we're gonna measure from this tab that we had Curry install on the rear that's very similar to the stock location up to the hole in the frame. Right at 19 and three quarter. Okay, now we're gonna put the jacks under here, compress the suspension and see what the short side of the shock's gonna be. Mm, right at 13 and a half. Well, now that we've got the measurements of our rear end travel based on our shock mounting points, we know how far the rear end's gonna travel and we also know the full extended and compressed lengths of the shocks that we need, but it's a little more complicated than that. We can actually use the shock as a stop for either the extended or compressed ends and because we have an air suspension, we don't want that shock to be the stop at full compression. Now our measurement on the short end is 13 and a half, so we wanna make sure that the full compressed length on the shock that we order is gonna be shorter than that. But on the other end of the spectrum, we actually wanna use the shock as a stop that way we save from damaging the bags if we accidentally overextend it. That way the shock's actually gonna stop it and keep us from doing that. And our measurement on that end is 19 and three quarter. So we're gonna err on the side of caution and order something in the range of 17 and a half to 18 and a half inches. So we just went to Summit Racing's website and we selected a few of the parameters and a couple of the options it gives you are both extended length and collapsed length of the shocks. And we want to make sure that our collapsed length is going to be below 13 and a half. And we want to keep our extended length somewhere around 17 and a half and 18 and a half. So we're going to click this one. I'm going to add that one and maybe this one as well. That'll fall in there just fine. Now, as far as the collapsed length goes, we have a few options here and a couple of them fall in the range that we're looking for. We get 11 and a half, and then that one's kind of on the edge of where we want to be, but we'll see what they've got here. Well, it looks like there's two options here. One's $26.97 each, and the other's $140 each. But those are for a Cadillac, so we want to stay away from those. Those are air shocks. These are the standard shocks we want to get. They're just an OE style shock. We'll get two of those. Let's take a look at a couple of shocks here. Now, this blue shock is actually what would be a stock replacement for our 72 Mercury. And the black one is the one we ordered from Summit Racing. And you can tell just by looking at them that the length is different. Now this blue one, it's not going to provide the stop that we want at full extension. It's actually too long. That's why we went with this black one. And another thing with this one, if you compress it all the way down, it's actually still going to be too long and it won't let our car lay out all the way like we want it to. So that's why we ordered these. We'll get the bushing in place for the upper mount, then attach it to the shock. With it fastened, we can get the lower mount run down, and then test the range of motion. We'll go to full compression first, and make sure the shock is happy and doesn't stop the travel. We're in good shape there, so we'll run it up to full droop and make sure that the shock is acting as a stop in the range that we want it to. Perfect. Still ahead, brake hoses, stud upgrades, and hood holes. Oh my. Hey guys, welcome back. While you were gone, we went ahead and ran some new hard brake lines where they needed to be replaced, and it's time to move on to the hoses. But up front here, we cut this one when we took it all apart originally, and we could replace that with an OEM style, but we've got a better solution. First thing is to go ahead and unfasten the old hose and get it out of the way along with this bracket. 
We'll plug off this brake line to minimize the mess. Now since the bracket was part of the original brake hose, Tommy made us a couple of new brackets here, which are going to bolt these to the frame. Now it's time to start thinking about connecting the dots between our calipers and our hard brake lines with some brake hoses. So we went to Crown Performance for those. Now at first glance, these may look like your run of the mill braided stainless hose, but they're not. This is a standard braided stainless hose and it does have a Teflon inner and the stainless braid. But the Crown versions have a five layer design with the same Teflon inner, a Kevlar braid, a protective sleeve, as well as the stainless braid. Now they're available in a bunch of different configurations and lengths and ends and nine different colors. Another cool thing about the crown hoses is that the ends are crimped on with a one piece crimp, which is stronger than your standard two piece crimp. With our new hose plugged into the caliper, we can get it fastened to the stock brake line as well. Make sure you use the included clip that keeps the line from rubbing and getting bound up. Hey y'all, while he's tidying up the brake lines, we run into a little bit of a problem whenever we was mocking up our wheels. Let me show you what I'm talking about. Take a look at the lug studs. You notice that they're not sticking through very far, and that doesn't give us enough threads for the wheel to stay on properly. We need to swap these out for some longer ones. So we went to ARP and got us another set of studs. Now these are substantially longer and quite a bit stronger than them OEMs. Now to get the old ones out, you could drive them out with a hammer and then drive the new ones in with a hammer as well. But whenever you have a press, it's just easier to do it that way. Like Tom said, you can do this with a hammer, but if you have access to a press, it makes the job a whole lot easier. You can see those studs cured our safety issue. Now we're one step closer to taking this big old boat for its maiden voyage. Up next, our hood won't close. No problem, we've got a saw to take care of that. Hey everybody, welcome back. Now while you were gone, we went ahead and got our brake system buttoned up on our big old Merc here. Got the wheels and tires back on it, back on the ground, and we're getting really close to taking it out for its maiden voyage. But there's a few things still missing. One of those two is going to be these newly refurbished bumpers from Advanced Plating. We're real lucky that just down the road from us in Nashville is one of the best chrome shops in the country. Advanced Plating can strip, repair, and re-chrome just about anything. We use them for all of our chrome work because they never fail to knock it out of the park. Even with some of the raggedy stuff we bring them. So of course, our Mercury bumpers went straight to them. I have to say, these bumpers look like jewelry now, and they're really going to set off our Mercury. Heck, this front bumper is about 50% of the nose of this old car. Can't wait to see what it looks like installed. First things first, we got to get all the goodies reattached to these bumpers, like the lights and brackets. Of course, we got a few pieces of new hardware to keep from blemishing the looks of the new bumpers. Well, we got our bumper on, and now the next task is pretty obvious that our hood's not going to close. So we're going to have to find a cure for it. This air cleaner is sticking well above the top of these fenders. The next process is going to be a little bit primitive, but I think it's going to turn out just fine. So the first step that we're going to do is make sure that the engine is sitting in the engine compartment center, if you will, from left to right. And to do that, you just simply measure from the air cleaner stud to the edge of the fender. Looks like we're at 32 and an eighth. Whenever you're doing something like this, you want to make sure that you measure in common points. All right, this is 
31 and 5 8 which is a half inch difference, which means it's only a quarter inch off. Take quarter inch away from one side, add it to the other, be in the center. Next thing we're gonna do is measure from the front of the hood all the way back to the carburetor. I'm setting it just to the side, and I'll do that here, and we're 34 and a quarter. Now we need to account for the gap at the leading edge of the hood, so we're just gonna take about an eighth inch off of that measurement. We'll mark it at 34 and an eighth, and we're gonna use the crown of the hood here as a guide. Now we just need to get those left and right measurements that we took earlier transposed here onto this line. It was 32 and an eighth, right? Then that's going to be 31 and 5 eighths. Now, where these lines intersect, that's going to be where our stud's going to come up through our hood. So, we just need to make a mark here, drill a hole. Then we need to figure out what our radius is going to be so we know how big our hole needs to be for that air cleaner. Now, that all is going to be determined by, like he said, how big this air cleaner is. Now, we want to make sure that we give it plenty enough room because that big block is liable to move around a bit whenever we actuate the throttle, if you know what I'm saying. So, we want to give it two inches on this side and two. So, we'll just add four inches total to this overall measurement. Our overall is 16 and a half plus those four inches of clearance is 20 and a half. Now we've got this piece of cardboard here, and this is going to be our tool that's going to allow us to make that big circle. So we just got a starting point here, and Tommy's measurement was 20 and a half, which is the diameter, so we're going to cut that in half to make our radius, which is going to be 10 and a quarter. So mark 10 and a quarter. Use our center punch here. All right, so I'm gonna use the drill bit that I used to drill this hole as the pivot point here in this cardboard. That's gonna go there. I'll just take the pencil through this hole that I made with the center punch, and that's gonna make our mark. With our circle marked out, we can make a hole to give our saw a place to start. Then it's time for the soothing song of a body saw. Now we are cutting through a little bit of brazing here, but not enough to compromise the strength of the hood too much. Tom, what do you think? Well, we caught a little bit of grief over this ride, but I do believe we did all right. I like it. After the break, it's our Merck's first cruise. Now, you know, we've used Yukon gear and axle in the past for needs for differentials and axles and things like that, but they're actually doing drive shafts now too. And we needed that drive shaft for our Mercury, so we just told them the dimensions we needed and what our power level was, and they made up this four inch aluminum piece for us right here in the USA. Now they do offer some that are ready to bolt in, say for like Mustangs and Jeeps like that, but if you need a custom one, they can do that too. She's about ready to fire, so we'll fill the fluids, including this Royal Purple Extreme Performance motor oil, which is gonna keep that gnarly big block nice and happy. We'll take her for a shakedown run, which is going to involve putting her through her paces, but not burying the throttle. You never do that with a fresh build. Once she's got a few miles on her, we can get her back to the shop and make sure everything is kosher. Next time you see her, we're going to open that throttle up. Well, we've been out riding around in our big body Mercury and we thought we'd have ourselves a pit stop and see a friend of ours and get his impression of our latest creation. Uh, hey, Smo, what are you doing? Hey, what's going on, man? I'm making breakfast. Here. I'm just joking. I'm making miniature log cabins. Chopping wood, guys. Nice. 
chasing the You may recognize Smoke, aka Big Smoke. He's a country rapper, musician, songwriter, producer, and film director. You might also recognize him from his TV show called, well, Big Smoke. Bro ham mercy. Look at this Merc mobile. <laughs> it's like the Stay Puff Marshmallow Man. Mm -hmm. I love it. Oh, my goodness. Uh, well, did it not come standard with that, what is that, a 19 inch hole in the hood? Well, yeah, we had to cut the hole. We didn't just do that for fun. We needed it, so. Wow, look at this thing, man. Makes about 750 horse the way you see it. With a 300 shot of nitrous, it'll make over a thousand. Well, do you wanna go for a ride? Heck yeah, I wanna go for a ride. Let's take this thing to the moon. So you think a big old car like this would be kinda slow, right? I mean, my granny's car was. Oh, was it like this? It was kinda like this. with this church I feel like I need to say a prayer <laughs> God help us in this beastly machine to survive the twists and turns of the road that lies ahead amen amen I like it that you kept the standard what is that an 8 track yeah 8 track and AM radio works a too. AM 8 track well, we can hear some here yeah Probably not on the AM, but I am working on releasing my new single on 8-track. Really? No. Wow. Well, we all know this old thing will run pretty good straight down the road. What do y'all say us go set up a few cones and see how she does on a slalom? Yeah, I want to see this thing dance. <laughs> assess the damage here oh that's right on point that's point spread look at that one two three four and five. Oh, we got a little dinger right there we got a wonky eyelid up here we're gonna need some duct tape well boys you built one heck of a car i'm talking about this is as cool as a car can be thanks man that yeah. means a lot coming from you because i know you like big cars like this so i do i love this car and you know it really makes me think about a song that I've got called Rollin' that we're gonna be shooting a video for real soon. This car would be perfect for that video. Oh, dude, that would be so awesome. Yeah. We could be in a music video. Wide open, got the tailpipe smoking. Lane to lane floating, no GPS loading. Cause even when I got no place to go, it's just me, myself, and the open road. And when I hit the high 20, I tell you what, you let me drive this thing, I'll let you be in my video. Deal. Let's do it. <laughs> <laughs> 